If you have your Bibles, well, I'd like for you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. That's where we're going to be. We started a new sermon series last week called Arrows, and we're taking a look at what it means to live our lives on target. In other words, if we as a Christian have a common goal, if we have a target that we want to hit, how do we do that? How do we hit the target of Christianity? I grew up... Um, you know, in Zanesville, Ohio, and I played football and baseball in my early youth, and I grew up with organized sports. And sports was a part of our culture. Uh, It was a part of my upbringing. It really refined my character. It shaped me and formed me into the person that I am today. And my football family eventually became, really, it's like your own family. I mean, we're spending every day together. We're eating together. We're we're even sleeping over at each other's houses. We're waking up at five o'clock in the morning and getting in early morning workouts and growing up together and sweating together and bleeding together. I mean, it is a total unity. For those of you who have served in the military, uh, we have a lot of guys who have served, uh, guys and gals who have served in the military. It's even more than that in a sports team. This bond and community that you have. Um, We have scouts with us today, the community that they share together, the family that they have together, and they're all trying to accomplish one single goal, to live on target. And as the church, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he's trying to do the same thing. We live in a world that doesn't really like the message that we preach. In fact, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, there are things in the Bible that we don't like. Christianity is hard, right? Recognizing some of these teachings that the Bible has to teach, it's hard, it's difficult, it's not easy. But we want to try to accomplish this goal together. And so last week, we talked about the idea of standing firm together in the face of opposition, True Christian maturity, to hit the target, is to be able to stand firm even when you face persecution. Today, we're going to look at what Paul has to say about standing firm against disunity or standing for unity. And so we're going to pick things up in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And Paul starts this. He uses a rhetorical style in order to bring about a point. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others." You know, as somebody uh, who grew up in the 90s, obviously the hero of our time was Michael Jordan, right? In my opinion, there will never be another Michael Jordan. MJ was it. He was the man. And one of the greatest things about Michael Jordan wasn't necessarily that he himself was the greatest, even though I believe that he was, but Michael Jordan was able to make everybody else around him great. Everybody else around him was great. And he had some really good players as well, but he was even to take, he was even able to take an average player. And he was even able to make them great. And why is that? Well, it's because playing for the Chicago Bulls wasn't all about MJ. If you look at people who are great, if you look at people who achieve greatness, nine times out of ten, it's because they're humble. They're sacrificial. They know that it's we, not I. They know that it's more important to lift their other teammates up and encourage them and motivate them because they're playing in a team sport. And look, Christianity is a team sport. You don't hit the target by living alone. You don't hit the target by being isolated or living by yourself or not connecting with other people. And if we are really going to hit the target in Christianity, the Bible says right here in Philippians chapter 2 that we must achieve humility. You know, Paul, as I said, he uses this rhetorical style. And what he's hoping to achieve is this, uh, achieve is this, a chain. He's hoping that if the Philippians are going to participate successfully with Paul in this struggle of standing firm, They must be unified. Got to do it together. I like what Frank Thielman had to write. He says, the point is that internal unity is necessary for holding back the destructive forces that would hinder the progress of the gospel. For the church, our main goal for Christian living is to share the gospel. That's why we're here. God wants to transform us, and by transforming us, he transforms the world. But there's a big roadblock in front of transforming the world with the gospel. And it's having a lack of unity. And Paul knows that. And he says, look, if you're going to be a mature Christian, if you're going to be a mature church, you've got to be willing to stand firm in the face of persecution, and you've got to strive for unity. So Paul goes into this, this rhetorical uh, questioning style. 
And you know, why does he do that? Most of us in the 21st century, right, if somebody approaches us like this, we probably would be highly offended. Well, what do you have to say about that, huh? Huh? What do you have to say about that, huh? Huh? Have you ever been talked to like that? I mean, it's absolutely maddening. You're like, dude, you're not going to disrespect me. You're not going to interrogate me. But for the ancient Greeks, a rhetorical style, and specifically what Paul's using here, was a way to express his endearment and gentleness. And so what he's saying is this, do we not all have encouragement in Christ? Do we not all have the same mind? Do we not all share in this same gospel motive? And so in this rhetorical style, Paul was able to level with the church of Philippi to get them focused on what they have in common. And you know what I have found in the church? When we spend more time on what we disagree with rather than what we agree with, we strive towards disunity rather than unity. When we're more focused on what's going wrong, even though dealing with things that are wrong are important, when that's our main focus rather than what's right, we struggle with being divided against ourselves. And so Paul, before he even approaches the subject of unity, he wants to recall to remembrance why they loved each other in the first place, what they had in common, what they were hoping to achieve together, and the things that they already had right. If you remember from a couple weeks ago, Paul, before he even deals with this issue at the church at Philippi, he wants to encourage them not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, yes, there are problems at the church at Philippi, but that doesn't mean I'm going to disregard all of the good things that are going between us as a church and as a preacher, Paul is speaking, and even amongst yourselves. And I think that's so important. Before you deal with conflict resolution, it's always important to remember what you have in common, why you got married in the first place, why you signed up in the first place, why you became a member in the first place. And so Paul's going to remind them about what they have in common. And then he's going to show them, look, here's the blessing of being in a Christian community. Here's the first thing that he points out. Do we not all have encouragement in Christ? It's a question. In other words, has Christ not built us up together? He appeals to their common experience. Are we not a part of the same movement? Are we not a part of the same Christ? And there is no doubt that Christ is on the side of unity. If you want to be on Jesus' side, you have to be on the side of unity. There is no other option. And so it's like being on the side of a sports team. You're either for them or against them. You're either with them or you're not. If you're a player on a sports team and you have a half-hearted commitment, not going to work. It's the same thing when it comes to unity in the church. If you are not for unity, the Bible is very clear, you're not for Christ. Jesus even had this to say when he prayed the night before he died. He prayed, he says, Father, I do not ask only for my disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, through the disciples' word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them. He's talking to his disciples. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and you love them even as you have loved me. In other words, the way the church is unified together is going to change how the world sees God's love for us. And think about this. Isn't this true? When you go into a church that's divided against itself, you're like, I don't want any part of that. When you're amongst a group of people that are bickering and fighting constantly, the last thing you want to do is stay in the room, right? I mean, think about your own families. Who wants to be inside of a family that is constantly contending and fighting and arguing and bickering and complete disunity in the family? Nobody wants that. Not on a sports team, not on a chess team, not on a church. People don't want that. Why? Because it's not how it was meant and planned to be. And so here's the question. Do we have the unity that Christ prayed for? And are we willing to strive for the unity that Christ prayed for? Look at the other question that he goes on to ask. Do we not have this comfort from love? This word comfort is periclesis. It means to come alongside somebody. It means to come alongside them and speak soft, soothing words that bring them comfort. And for the most part, this word was used in the context of being in court. You would have a paraclete. Somebody would come alongside you and speak on your behalf and give you the assurance that you needed to win in your trial. But it also talks about this in other types of aspects. When you look in the New Testament, for instance, this word is used of persuading or advising. It literally means to come alongside someone and give them hope. Paul says, look, don't you, don't you remember? 
as we're struggling with what it means to have disunity, don't you remember that we're all hoping and trying to achieve the same thing? Don't you remember when I came alongside you and pointed you to hope when you were hopeless? Don't you remember that? You see, the key phrase is simply this. It is a love that moves to action. That's what this word comfort really means. And Paul says there is no more comfort or encouragement outside of Christ and what you have experienced. This is real. This is tangible. And it's given us the ability to overcome difficulties. And I would think if you've been in this church for any experience, uh, any experience or any extended period of time, you would know that the church has helped us overcome difficulties of our past. We need to remember that. We need to remember that. He goes on to say this, do we not have participation in the Spirit? This word is fellowship, right? Fellowship on Sunday morning. But a better explanation of the word is participation. Now here's the question. Do you participate in Sunday? Do you participate in the church? You know, as we talk about this idea of maturity, I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make is mistaking longevity for maturity. Just because you've been in the church the longest doesn't mean you're any more mature than the person who's been in the church the shortest. Maturity is not reflected in longevity. There are people who have been doing their jobs for quite some time, and you would never hire them for your work, right? Just because they've been in it a long time doesn't necessarily make them mature, experienced, well-grounded. And it's the same thing for the church. Just because we come to church and we've been in church and we've known God our entire lives doesn't make us mature. What direction are you heading in rather than what goals have you accomplished? And that's how we need to change how we view this idea of maturity. Paul says, are you a participant in the Spirit? Is God's Spirit moving in you? Are you partaking in Him? Is He partaking in you? Are you working? Are you doing? And don't we all have that? And that's what Paul's reminding them of. Don't you guys remember that we are participating in this same Spirit? The same Spirit that's working in me is the same Spirit that's working in you. This is what it means to be unified. And then he finally says this, do we not all have the same affection and sympathy? You know, affection and sympathy is just simply human kindness. In other words, if you have any affection for me, Paul says, you're going to listen to what I'm saying. And you know a church is on the same page when they listen to each other. And what happens when a church doesn't listen to each other? They start yelling at each other and fighting with each other. And there has been nothing more harmful than the church, to the church than disunity. People can't stand it. You go into a church and they're bickering and fighting, the last thing you want to do. So we know what's at stake here, don't we? We know how important this is for the church at Philippi. They are putting their uh, reputation on the line for Jesus Christ, and Paul knows it. Disunity is at stake. And so what's the target? That's the question. What is the target that we're moving towards? Paul says, look what we have And let's move forward to this common goal. Here's the first target, he says in verse 2. I want you to have the same mind. It literally means to think the same thing. Now, Paul's not saying drink the Kool-Aid, okay? Paul's not saying I want you to have uh, blind allegiance to the gospel. We need a church, a group of people who are willing to think through things and not necessarily agree on everything. That's how progress is made. It's okay to disagree. The question is, how do you deal with that disagreement? Do you think the same thing about what it means to move in the same direction? Do you think the, th- the same thing about what it means to deal with conflict resolution? So let's say you disagree with something in the church. How do you handle that? Are you on the page that Jesus is on when it comes to unity? Are you willing to handle yourself in the right way? Ask the right questions with the right attitude and the right spirit? I mean, think about it like this. If you disagreed with something and somebody disagreed with something in you, how would you want them to approach you? How would you want them to talk to you? How would you want them to bring it up to you? Think about that. And that's what Paul's saying that I want you to do. I want you to have the same mind. I want you to have a solid commitment to moving forward, to being mature in Christ. Here's the other thing he says. Here's the second goal. I want you to have the same love. The the word literally means to have, I know, it's overly romantic, okay? Two hearts that beat as one. (laughs) That's what he's saying. That's what I want for the church. I want their heartbeat to be of the same cadence. I want them to have the same kind of love. That's the goal. What is that kind of love? Well, we know it's self-sacrificial, and we know it's not emotional feeling. We know that self-sacrificial love acts. That's the kind of love that Paul wants us to have. It's acting like this because God treated us like this. So here's the question. Do you want God to treat you 
the way that you treat other people. It's pretty simple. To have the same kind of love for each other is to have the same kind of love that God has for us. It's self-sacrificial and it acts. Jesus ultimately sacrificed himself on the cross. He acted towards us. And so we as a church, if we're going to achieve the kind of unity that Paul wants us to have, that God wants us to have, it has to come at the cost of dying to ourselves. And our culture does not like that. We are highly individualistic. We are egocentric. It is about us, what works for us, what helps us, what gets us more money, more time, more wealth, more things. I mean, if you were to step out into our culture, it is egocentric, all about you, me time, I, me, what I want. And if I don't get taken care of, nobody's getting taken care of. That is what we face in our culture, and that is what we wake up to every day. But the gospel tells us unity at the cost of yourself. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, finally, brothers, I want you to be of one mind. He says, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And so Paul wants us not only to have the same kind of love, but also to be in one accord. He says, to have one mind. It's like a symphony, all playing together. Now, uh, we have family. Love my family. But my family members sometimes like to get our kids instruments. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you struggle with hate and the Bible says you can't hate people? It's a struggle, is real. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know what I did? It's total payback because whenever I would go to birthday parties and I'd have kids, I would always get like toys that made noise. Isn't that messed up? And I would laugh and giggle about that. Well, it's coming full circle now, man. Yeah, uh, Piper got a piano, a little piano. It's the worst sound I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> they had a xylophone, and she's like, where is it at, Daddy? Where is it? And I'm like, huh. <laughs> I don't want to lie, so I just try to grumble. So that way, you know what I mean? Oh, man, there's flutes and all kinds of stuff, and they're just like, bang, 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 bang. You know what it usually happens? when I'm trying to make a phone call. <laughs> and so I lock myself in the bedroom and they come to the door, Dad, I'm serious, I'm not even lying to you this morning. Like, Dad! It's like they're dying because I've taken myself to a different room. Where's Dad? It's the moment you actually have to do something is when they really actually want you. Oh man, it's terrible. Look, don't get my kids instruments, okay? I'm telling you right now, <laughs> don't do it. I'm gonna take them back. I'm taking them to Walmart and I'm getting like food or something, man. It's, that's what's going down. But Paul is saying to be of one accord, to have the same mind, it literally means to live according to the same cadence. It's like the whole congregation, he says, is kept in tune. You're kept in tune. You hit the notes. You play at the right time. That's what it means to have this same mind, this same intent on one purpose. It literally means this, to have the same inner attitude about life. And look, we talked about this two weeks ago and even last week. God probably will not change your circumstance, but the Holy Spirit can dynamically change how you deal with your circumstance. And it really ultimately reflects in our attitudes, how we perceive and react to life. Paul in chapter one had a divine perspective with a Christ-like attitude. And Paul says, if you are going to be in one accord of the same mind, you gotta have the same kind of attitude about life. I like what Tim Keller has to say. He says, humble people, this idea of humility, are like toes. Who wants to be a toe? Nobody, right? But humble people are like toes. Here's what he says. The truly gospel humble person is a self-forgetful person whose ego is just like his toes or her toes. It just works. It does not draw attention to itself. The toe just works. The ego just works and neither draw attention to themselves. Hey, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing. Check it out, baby. I'm looking awesome. Look at me accomplish this thing. That's how my kids are, man. They want attention, they crave it. And that's okay because they're immature and I give them attention. I'm like, oh, you did such a good job drawing the marker on the wall like that. <laughs> I'm so happy. Or when she's playing, daddy, look at me, look at me playing on the piano and all keys are being hit at once and Knox is over there going, ha, 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 ha. That's literally what he does. Ha, 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 ha. And I taught him this, and he goes, ha, ha, that's what he does. It's awesome. 
They crave that because they're immature, they're children. The toe just works. It doesn't need attention. It doesn't crave it. It says, it's okay if I never get the recognition or the glory. I'm here to serve God. That's what Paul's talking about. And so how can we hit the target? If the target is humility, how in the world do we attain that? How do we hit it? Well, it's simple. Humble-mindedness. Humble-mindedness. Here's what he says in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing. Zero. Nada. None. Absolutely not. And that's tough. And I'm speaking from experience. I'm a selfish person. Are we not? Aren't we? We are selfish people. I mean, that's our instinct. That's our nature. That's the corruption that's taken place. We care about ourselves so deeply and so much that we're going to do whatever it takes to help ourselves and protect ourselves. And Paul says, look, if you're going to achieve this goal as the church, you have to be humble in your mind. And here's the cost. Do nothing from selfish conceit or ambition. And here's the question. If inner attitudes determine our conduct, where will negative attitudes like selfishness and empty conceit get us? Well, this is where it got the church of Philippi. They didn't have unity. That's where it will get us at our jobs, in our relationships, on our teams, in our country, in our church. And if we are selfish and we are conceited, we will not achieve unity. Unity comes at a cost. That's what it means to be unified together. Selfishness literally means to knock other people down. He says, don't do anything at the cost of knocking other people down. It's a word that Paul previously used, if you remember, in chapter 1, verse 17, where he says there are other preachers of the gospel, and they're preaching the truth. And I'm glad they're preaching the truth, but they're preaching it in such a way to afflict me in my chains. They want to cause me harm. Paul says, don't do that. Don't make your success about other people losing. And that's tough. Because in sports, in the real world, usually that's how we win, isn't it? Forcing the other person to lose. Paul says that's not how it's supposed to be in the church. He says don't have any empty conceit. It literally means a hollow opinion. It's to elevate yourself above others. It's seeking honor. It's wanting to be acclaimed by others. That's not built on character. It's all flattery. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I achieve. Look what I can do. Look what I've done. And it's not grounded in character. And so really what Paul's saying is don't have a better than thou attitude. I'm just better than other people. Can't help it. Sorry that they suffer. Sorry that they don't have my knowledge or my looks or my achievements. Or my status not my fault they were born in a different country. <laughs> it's deadly. It's a sin sickness. It's a disease. And so Paul doesn't want the church to knock each other down or brag about themselves because of an inflated opinion. He goes on to say in verse 3, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And so what's the medicine for selfishness? What's the medicine? What's the antidote to being conceited? Humble-mindedness. You know, the Greeks, they used a similar word to describe a coward or somebody that would submit out of fear. And Paul took that word that they used in classical Greek, and he changed it a little bit. And he literally meant it like this, to stoop low in order to bring others up. Paul's not asking you to be an intellectual or physical coward. What he's asking you to do is to sacrifice yourself, to love others with a self-sacrificial love in order to lift the entire group up, to think of yourself less, not to think less of yourself. And that's why I like what C.S. Lewis had to write in Mere Christianity. He says, the thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It's thinking of myself less. That's the essence of a gospel-centered person. We really don't think about ourselves a whole lot. And when you talk with a gospel-centered person, they usually make it all about you, wanting to know how you are, what's going on with you, what they can pray for you about, how life is going for you. That's what Paul is saying. This is how we achieve unity, humility. He says, count others more significant than yourselves. Here's what that literally means. It's thoughtful consideration of others. It's a call to give others the benefit of the doubt. It's a call to think of others not as superior, but as worthy of preferential treatment, to think about another person. It's the opposite of thinking everyone for themselves. 
And man, that's how it can be in this world, is it not? Everyone's out for themselves. I've got a picture for you. You know, 99% of you are probably exactly going to know what this is. What is it? Isn't that sick? We know what it is. <laughs> L- literal people have died from being trampled on to get electronics. Everybody for themselves. I mean, our culture, this is us. This is what we deal with. This is what we struggle with. This is what we wrestle with. Everybody for themselves, punching each other, insulting one another, pepper spraying each other, fighting one another just to get a TV. Look at this person dragging themselves across the TV. Kudos to the little girl who's banded it up. You know what I mean? Wow. But holy cow. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Look out for yourself because nobody else is going to do it, right? And what Paul is saying is even if nobody else does, don't fall into the trap of selfishness and an egocentric life. And think of it like this. If we each think of each other better than ourselves, how can there possibly be any animosity between us? We won't fight. And when we do, it'll be with the right attitude and the right perspective, with the right goal. The goal is not to split apart. The goal is to stay together. And we must achieve that at all costs. And then finally, we'll end with verse 4. He says, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, he's not teaching us monasticism, which is this retreat-like idea that God wants you to rid yourselves of all your money, all your time, all your clothes, don't own a home, don't own a car, and if you own anything, you're living in opposition to the gospel. What does he literally say? Look not only to his own interests. That still includes you. Do you know what the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's impossible to fulfill the great commandment if you don't love yourself. And so Paul's saying, look, don't look only for your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do not selfishly fix your eyes upon your own thing at the exclusion of other people. It's okay to be motivated. It's okay to want to accomplish great things. It's okay to accomplish great things, but not at the cost of being a totally selfish person who knocks other people down and who inflates themselves that's not built on character. And so he says, look out for other people. And that's what Jesus taught us. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 19, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And so here's here's the key idea. Be helpful wherever it is needed. If it's communion cleanup in the back, if it's serving, offering a communion here in service, if it's fixing something around the church, if it's answering that phone call when somebody's in need, if it's becoming a part of a ministry team, if it's writing a note of encouragement to the teachers who watch our children and love them and protect them and watch over them, if it's to our security ministry who are on constant... uh, Vigilant um, idea, whatever that is. (laughs) I'm not in security. I don't know. I'm protected. But whatever it is, Paul says, be ready to help people whenever they're in need. And so what's the target of Christian living? Stand united against disunity in the church. We don't want that. We're here together. We're in it for each other. But you know what? You can't stand for unity if you're not a part of the team. You ever notice that? You can't stand for unity if you're never a part of the team. And so how can we fight something when we're not a part of something? How can we strive for unity when we're not a part of what it means to be unified? You know, the gospel is very clear. If you want to become a part of the team, if you want to be in this thing for each other, unified together, if you want to take the step for unity, saying, I am for unity, Paul simply says, repent. And be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're willing to place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, that he is who he claimed to be, based on the evidence that we find in the scriptures, and you're willing to strive for unity, and you're willing to turn away from your sins and be baptized in water, Jesus says you can become a part of this team, just like the rest of us. 
And so that's my encouragement to you. Are you willing to strive for the target of Christian living by hitting the target of becoming a part of the team? If you're willing to do that, we're going to sing a song here in a few minutes. You can come down front and you can find out more about baptism. If you don't want to do that because you're afraid of big crowds, you can fill out the connection card on the chair in front of you and take it to our welcome center after service and check Mark off on there. I want to learn more about what it means to become a Christian. I want to learn more about baptism. You can do that anytime. Let's stand and let's pray.